lot of this conference actually would never be possible without Nassim. So the story goes that I read The Black Swan in 2007-ish, and in there, he talked about Art Devaney. And from uh, Nassim's book, I went online and started reading about Art's work, and Art was writing about evolutionary fitness. And um, I uh, started blogging about these kind of ideas a little bit, integrating like Nassim's perspective on um, the map of life towards health. And uh, when we decided to just put a blog post up on my blog about the idea of having a symposium, you know, my whole my whole motivation was that maybe we could have a positive black swan. So I think serendipity is definitely um, a big part of why we're here. And I think we can owe Nassim a thanks for that and sharing his ideas. I'm honored to be here because I, I see a lot of my friends and a lot of people uh, I know from the web. I mean, I, my access to the web is limited to uh, interesting stuff. So I, mean, I, I don't go to the New York Times, I go to you guys. So I recognize a lot of faces. And, and, and most of them look exactly in person as they do on the pictures. Not always the case. <laughs> uh, the, the, can we can we have the can we have the, it'd be helpful if we had the picture here? Although a little bit random, it's not always the same. We can so I would hear you. Some someone should take care of it. You know, my, uh, okay, so uh, they're complaining about the volume. Can you hear me now? All right, they're complaining about both the volume. And I'm complaining about the absence of slides. Very good. <laughs> so uh, I was a trader for 20-some years, specializing in uh, volatility. It does exist as a special options and things that depend on volatility. Something tells me that, that this is uh, that these two don't go together well. Is it okay now? Okay. So uh, I specialize in seeing how things have response. From random event. That was my specialty. After I retired, like all like traders want to retire, I uh, uh, decided to become a scholar in that domain uh, human errors, uh, things related to uh, responses, you know, it's not studying how people make errors, but rather how systems respond to errors, which is a different, complete different discipline, uh, as we'll see. And of course, my latest uh, work is on how systems or has exact opposite characteristics uh, of uh, what you think is fragile. The fragile breaks on when there's a random event. It doesn't have any upside. Some system needs some disorder. <laughs> Let me uh, put a few questions here, right? And, and the crowd will help me uh, get to where I'm getting. Uh, we have here on the left a beautiful uh, highway leading to North New Jersey. And here you have something uh, much messier, okay, higher dimensionality. Which one do you think is more attractive? Yes. Okay, all right. How many of you believe that nature can have ugly scenes outside of things that are threatening? Where? What can be ugly in nature? Yeah. An example. What? Sorry. Sorry. I'm talking from the aesthetic standpoint. The aesthetics of, of the scene, you know, an image of something natural. So, here, what distinguishes nature from man-made objects? Yeah, it's probably. Testing, can we switch it on? Okay. Yeah, this is a lot better. <laughs> That's the other one was coming back to me with the uh, okay. So <laughs> nature has dimensionality. 
you find it aesthetically preferable, no? Okay. Look at this wall and look at this picture. Okay. What's the difference between the two smoothness? This is less smooth, has more variation. Now you may say that you prefer this picture to that one, a French versus an English garden. Okay. <laughs> but nevertheless, you will still prefer this to a picture of Newark. <laughs> no? Or to the wall over there. Okay? okay? This will explain a lot of things in life. Why is it that we're harmed by the regular? This is maximal smoothness, and this is where I take my walks. Now you make the connection. All right? Make the connection between this and this. Dimensionality of the exercise. Okay? And the same applies to your visual space. Is that you, you'd like to have more, some kind of variability in the environment. This is not natural. These corners up there are not natural. So I was in, in Rome, in the Museum of the Vatican, where I noticed that every single artifact had smaller details. Nothing was smooth. They found ways, these are uh, oil lamps, they find ways to put details in them. And it's not the property of objects that survived. I said, okay, maybe the rich, you know, had that. Went to, uh, you look at low-income housing in Rome, they had that property. Something called Insule, the equivalent, they look today like Park Avenue apartments, but in fact, the low-income housing, they had this property. They have the rich in details. Nothing is smooth. Now, from there, we can generalize a lot of things. Do you see the connection with Palio? Not yet. You're starting to see. All right, we have another 25 minutes. <laughs> okay, to make you understand it. So, the biggest mistake we have had in modernity is the notion that lowering risk means lowering variability. That lowering, you know, we have an aversion. We want to survive, we have an aversion random events, you agree? But the problem is never before today that we control our environment. So that, that just like, <laughs> You know, you have a predilection for cars, you agree? It did not harm us because we didn't control the environment. Today we control it, so we have a lot more cars. It's the same thing with randomness. You need some dose of randomness, some dose of variability. Otherwise, you are harmed. And we're throwing the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> because randomness generally can harm you, okay? Being averse to it doesn't, you know, hurt you if you can't control the environment. Today we can control the environment, we put too much smoothness. So to me, anti-fragile is this necessity to have some kind of stressor, random event, uh, variability, volatility. They're all part of this, what I call the solar cluster, and they all affect you the same way, and they're necessary. We're going to get to Palio in a few minutes. But you know the mistakes about comfort. All of you have heard of post-traumatic uh, disorder, no? Where random events supposedly harm people. Has any one of you heard of uh, something much more prevalent called post-traumatic growth? Okay, a few of you now. People don't talk about it because nobody can make money curing it. You see? <laughs> they don't want to sell you post-traumatic disorder. It is a big problem. Because, as you see, uh, we need some disorder, we need random events. People don't realize that the organic communicates with the environment, the stressors, and develops to bounce back higher than the stressor. If I lift 100 pounds, my body codes for lifting more than 100 pounds. So you upregulate a lot of things just from stressors. So stressors are necessary. That's the idea behind anti -fragile. Now, let me link it to biology and research, which I find very sloppy, nutrition, biology, all that, without taking into account this property of the S-curve. Everybody knows about the S-curve, no? This is the S-curve, dose response. 
And you see there's a phase where it's convex and a phase in it when it becomes concave. No? You have saturation at some point, supposedly, and you start at zero. No? So the curve has to have that shape. It's an S. It has to be convex in the early stages and concave later on, so long as you have saturation. And using this, anything can be OK for you, provided you don't have it in large quantities, even cyanide. OK? Now, let's investigate the idea. There's something in math called Jensen's inequality. And it tells you the following. If I have a concave response, that's a lot better for me to have 80% than 120% rather than 100%. You agree? It's better to spread out things. And it's pretty much a mathematical property that it's any linear combination that's not the average is better than the average. In other words, it's much better to have 4,000 calories one day, zero the next, up to a point, than have 2,000 calories every day, or have 82 <laughs> and a half calories every hour, or something like that. You agree? So, if you agree with this, and this is a mathematical property, then a lot of the research is sloppy. But what I've done here is done something I call a generalized S-curve. I'm generalizing the S-curve. You can start, it doesn't have to be like the, the green is the S-curve we saw earlier, all right? Where you start uh, you know, at zero and then it's capped. But you can have sort of like, uh, say, visit to Philadelphia, where uh, more is more up to a point, and then you have this curve, where you end up worse off. I'd much rather not go to Philadelphia than go five times to Philadelphia, all right? Once is better than, than zero, but five is worse than. Okay. Oh, it's the same as selling books. I'd rather sell 100,000 copies of a book. If you sell a million, you're here. People think you're an idiot, right? <laughs> if you sell, so there's a point. So you want to sell more than zero, but less than a million, right? That, that's the idea. Okay. So, so this is the dose response. This is a generalized, I call it generalized dose response curve. And I, you, know, you can find it on the web. There's a mini MOOC explaining it. And it applies, it's, it has to apply as a necessity to anything in nature. Because you have more is more, less is more. You can you actually start with, with, you can have the opposite, where the more is more is at zero. You know, we start being harmed directly. But it has to be then concave and then convex. The thing breaks is convex. So let's apply this. In a convex phase, you see the convex curves inward? In a convex phase, you want more randomness. In a concave phase, you want less randomness. That's called the second order effect. And let me explain why the average doesn't matter. This here is in, from, lifted from anti-fragile. Uh, assume that, uh, you know, what's the optimal temperature for, you have grandmothers, no? What's the optimal temperature for your grandmother? 70 degrees? Yeah, 70 degrees? Okay, perfect. So you have the information that your grandmother spent the last two days at the temperature of 70 degrees on average. You'd be happy for your grandmother, no? That's the first order effect, it's the average. Now you get the second piece of information. She spent the first day at zero degrees and the second day at 140 degrees, okay? So you can imagine that you're going to have an inheritance, no, no more grandmother. <laughs> When you're in a concave phase, you want as little randomness as possible around the average. When you're in a convex phase, by right, something called Jensen's inequality, you want as much variation as you can around the average, provided you stay in that convex phase. You see? And this is, in fact, temperature were a little convex around the edges here, but definitely between 0 and 140 is not good, all right? Say between 50 and 110, maybe. So this is sort of like the idea. Let's apply it now, how people miss it, and we're going to get to paleo. Thermal exposure, you need variability in temperature. Living at 70 degrees is not healthy. We are not made to live with air conditioning and heating on the same day. <laughs> we're not made for that. And then in the second column, the comment, 
maybe there's a process that helps, we're called bone, bone adipose tissue, stuff like that, whatever it is, really that's healthy, but I couldn't care less, and such heuristics are unnecessary. Remember, I'm saying we can control our environment, hence the temperature today, all right? In the past, it was not possible. So you were forced to be healthy, thanks to the variability that we don't have today. Second point, this is the only place in medicine where explicitly they use that mathematical formula that I gave you, okay? Pulmonary ventilators. If you give a patient 80% of the dose, or 120% of in the lungs, they do a lot better than if you gave them 100%. They die. You need to vary it. Okay. That's the only place in the literature. Energy and deficit. Ah, here we come. Diabetes. Everybody thinks that diabetes is a result of what? Of being overweight. You agree? But then, and the evidence is that those who are overweight, when they lose weight, what happens? You can effectively cure diabetes by putting anyone on 600 calories a day, there's a place in Siberia, very cheap, and they've been doing it for a century. Okay? You can, it, it, you don't cure diabetes, it's the most effective uh, treatment known. Okay, just like ketogenic for children is the most effective cure for uh, uh, athletic uh, you know, conditions, all right? So, you can, no, normally you would say, okay, Therefore, fat. Aha. Think about it again. These people, if they gain their weight back, they will not have diabetes for a few years. Which tells you it's not the fat that's the cause of diabetes, it's the absence of the stressor of hunger that's the cause of diabetes for them. You go through phases of hunger. You were made to go through phases of hunger. If you don't have hunger, you got a problem. See? It's just like people understand that lifting weight is good for you. They don't understand that going hungry is good for you as well. <laughs> you see? Okay. So, let me continue other uh, stuff. Uh, intermittent fasting is the ancestral heuristic. We had no control, so you had to do it. Aha, except some religions okay, figured out that intermittent fasting was no longer imposed on us by the environment. No? So what do you do? Ramadan. Uh, the, the Semites have forced mandatory fasting. And even if you go to an ancestral you know, religion, pagan religion have also mandatory fasting periods. But now there's something more interesting than this. Have you all heard of the Cretan diet? Okay, the Cretan diet was discovered that Mediterranean diet was healthy for people. Someone discovered it in the 60s or 70s. So there are zillion papers on Cretan diet. But if you ate feather cheese and uh, this and that, and, uh, a lot of fish, <coughs> they'd be okay, no? All right. But turns out, turns out to be completely bullshit the way they did it. <laughs> Sorry, my expression, all right? And let me explain. I am a Greek Orthodox, Mediterranean. We have between 150 and 200 days, depending how religious you are, of vacant. We're vacant for these number of days, okay? <coughs> deprived of, literally, almost deprived of all proteins. And people in Crete <laughs> subscribe to that diet. They eat a lot of lamb on Sunday, Eastern Sunday, stuff like that. But they have 40 days of herring fast before Sunday. Every Wednesday and Friday are vegan, plus another 40 days here and there. OK. Uh -huh. Now it looks like there is a genesis inequality effect with protein. Not only with calories, but with protein. We're not supposed to have protein six meals a day but before weightlifting, after weightlifting, before this, before that, okay? We're not supposed to. And let's look at the logic. What's the logic? Can someone tell me the logic? We humans are omnivores, okay? If you're omnivore, it means that you were not omnivore by, by choice, okay? We're not made omnivores because it's good to have a steak with a salad and then dessert later, no? <laughs> You're omnivores because the environment doesn't supply you with what you need all the time, okay? Now, we're one part cow, you agree? And what does a cow eat? Salad without dressing. Okay. <laughs> the most boring thing, right? And how many hours do they eat a day? 
a long time to gather nutrients, all right? When one part lion, what does a lion eat? I mean, how often does he eat meat? Uh -huh. every, uh, every hunt, okay? How often does he hunt? Four times a day? Okay, there you go. Sorry? It's a female, but uh, how many, how many <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> it's good to be around. Okay, so the, the hunting, actually he hunts for the difficult ones, right? He gives a helping hand. But the, the so the idea, okay, of, um, you know, of, of uh, stochasticity applies more to protein. And effectively, we're not made to have protein for meals a day. Your kidneys suffer. You're supposed to have fat and protein you're supposed to have them by big lumps. So when someone tells me I am paleo, right, uh, what are you eating? Say, I'm only eating meat today. All right, I say, well, are you paleo? Well, depends on paleos on Sundays, right? <laughs> but, uh, that's the problem. So you have to realize that the food groups, each one has a degree of variance supplied by the environment, okay? And that's what being paleo, if you want to be ancestral, that's where you be ancestral is you eat grass when, you know, for uh, I don't know how many days, and then you hunt. And even then hunting, all right, is very stochastic. Some days you get a lot, some days you get nothing. And effectively, uh, you know, you know that uh, uh, if you have breakfast, your vision drops, okay? The lions, you know, you know after, they, you, after they miss a hunt, guess what? Their vision improves, okay? okay. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the other stuff and intermittent fasting, I'm just putting a somewhere a little more statistical rigor around the point of, of fasting. Putting you know, putting it in, in some framework that can be analyzable without all these anecdotes here and there. This is good, this is good, you see. So this is the idea. So how do we execute that? Uh Gad uh, uh Saad is gonna definitely talk about bounded rationality. But my idea is what is called convex heuristic, is anti-fragile heuristic, as decision-making under uncertainty, which is my real uh, day job, not uh, paleo stuff, right? Decision-making and handling in a certain environment, that a good heuristic isn't something that's good or bad, or true or false, but it's not something true or false. It's not something measured in true space, something measured in consequence space. You see, whether if you look, use it for a long run, it will help you survive. That's vastly more important uh, than, than something that you judge true or false. Okay, this is true, this is false. And the other thing is that we should not look at the survival of heuristic by the survival of populations. Like the religion is, everybody say, well, it's false. Yeah, but look at the population and look at what it helps us. And also it's a conveyor of heuristic, namely the Greek Orthodox method of forcing you to not eat meat on, on uh, Wednesday. And meat, no, it's, it's not just uh, meat that you can't uh, eat. You can't eat, uh, you can't have any animal product on Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay. So this is uh, the, the main idea. And uh, let me add something about the approach that I propose in, in, in my book and my work, what I call phenomenology, not theory. A lot of people come in and they need a theory to be convinced of something. Theories come and go. The, the, the mechanisms stay. So I find it vastly more rigorous to have something that can withstand okay, change of theory than something that depends on a theory. And let me give you an explanation. Like when I started weightlifting, all I do is weightlifting. So I had this thing, I showed uh, Hamurabi, I only talk what I do. In finance, I only write about what I do. So if I make a mistake, I'm harmed. That's sort of my ethics. So I am against the idea of being low body fat, all that but rather increase muscle mass for humans. <laughs> anyway, so, but, so I started weightlifting, and, and people told me, well, when you weightlift, you get thinner. Why? Because muscles were more whatever, okay, good. When you weightlift, you do this, okay. So there are 50 theories, but it still remains that when you weightlift, you get thinner, <laughs> okay? And then people have this idea that when you weightlift, you know, you tear some muscles, micro tear, that it gets bigger. That's one theory. You can look at a completely different theory that when you weight lift, you're giving signal to your brain to upregulate something, makes you more insulin sensitive, stuff like that. And then, you know, whatever the theory, who cares? You know that if you weight lift, you're going to gain muscle mass. But this is a phenomenology. 
that's vastly more robust. It's a little complicated here, but you've got to use phenomenology. In other words, you don't need a theory to prove something. Uh, before I finish, let me, uh, I mean, I have here some questions that this uh, uh, being fixated on percentage body fat is irrelevant. It should be metabolic fitness, and, uh, and, and we have evidence of longevity. It's, uh, body fat doesn't harm longevity, but uh, fat it helps. It looks like, uh, and plus the aesthetics, you have to rely on on aesthetics as a, a, a surviving heuristic, that someone uh, thin is, has never been attractive in history until 25 years ago because of Vogue magazine, all right? <laughs> you see? So particularly for, for, for females and for males, the idea is not to be uh, low body fat, but to have high muscle mass, which is completely different, okay? Uh, the, uh, so, and here, let me uh, uh, finish with one thing about mother nature the statistical properties of Mother Nature, and which will support the paleo movement, but hopefully by adding a second order effect. So far in history, there's nothing we humans have been able to introduce into a healthy body that has not had what we call yetogenic, some side effects somewhere. When I wrote antifragile, someone wrote to me that there's an exception to my statement. What was it? Aspirin. The ink was not dry on his uh, letter, hate mail, all right? Till, the, you know, there was this uh, other email that came to me showing how uh, 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 aspirin increase, uh, triples the risk of blindness. <laughs> so you get the idea. So with this, we can have some rules about Mother Nature. If you're healthy, very healthy, Okay, you don't, you take medicine, odds are Lipitor, all that is gonna harm you. If you're one standard deviation away from health, actually I use one and a half mean deviations away from health, okay? A little more than standard deviation. And you take any of these medicine, you have one in 67 chances of being helped. You realize that? And close to 100% chance of getting some harm somewhere. Okay? Now, if you're six mean deviations away, which means about four sigma, four some seven deviations, I don't use sigma because for other reasons, uh, you have 90% chance of being helped by these medicines. But think if you were pharma, okay? If you were pharma, who would you try to medicate? Everyone. Sorry? Everyone. Someone who's, think about it, someone who's slightly hypertensive, okay, has almost no chance of being helped by your medication, okay? Or it's like a lottery ticket. But someone very hypertensive has a great chance of being helped. Now, how many more do you have who are slightly hypertensive or than very many? Okay, 4,000 times more. So if you're a pharma, this is your market. People who live long, all right? You cannot have, you may kill them prematurely, but still it's better off then people are going to die. <laughs> right. So this is the idea. A pharma tries to cure the healthy, not the very unhealthy. And this argument can be folded into an argument in favor of Mother Nature, is that Mother Nature has seen 4,000 times more someone slightly ill than someone very ill. You see, and so therefore you can use the argument in favor of modernity when someone is away from uh, normalcy. You see, one away from the center. If you're very ill, that's fine. If you have cancer, so the, the, my attitude is as follows: as a rule, never see a doctor. But if you have cancer, see five, not one. <laughs> okay, you see the idea. If you're very ill, see a lot more because within a band, odds are you're going to be harmed a lot more by medicine than health. And this sort of I'm formalizing now, and, and people, I'm starting to get hate mail. Thankfully for this. You know you're on the right track based on the number of hate mail. Like when I wrote The Black Swan, I started getting a lot of hate mail. Now I know I was on the right track. Great. Thank you for listening to me. And, uh, My question is, uh, if stage one is getting hate mail, what is stage two? <laughs> uh, 
Is this working? Yes. Stage one, uh, that's true. Stage one is getting hate mail. Stage two is getting an email from Seth Roberts. Would you like that one? <laughs> <laughs> and stage three is when people who normally you like because they're, they go against the grain start disagreeing with you. All right? When one becomes, your idea becomes part of the, the vocabulary, like the white swan. Then, then have, I, I myself go against it. That's stage three. I have a question about variability. So some people think about the sickness as a breakdown of the ability to maintain physiological variables within an adequate range of dynamic homeostasis or heterostasis, whatever you want to call it, that changes. So if there's greater variability in the physiology, could you explain how you articulate that in relation to what you were just saying about okay. variability in the environment? OK, let's take my slides that are showing you the S-curve, and then maybe a little bit of sickness. Diarrhea once in a while is good for you. Too much is bad for you. It's the same thing as a, uh, the same as selling books. You know, you sell a little bit of books, it's good for you, you see? So sickness may peak somewhere. You mean you need uh, to get diarrhea, so you can probably, you know, spend time uh, meditating about uh, theological matters. <laughs> the environment gave us routine diseases, you see? Then they're necessary. This is how, as a principle, I go by that if we fit for hunger, and okay, then it has to be necessary somewhere. And you could probably see it pulled out from here, the necessity of hunger. Okay, so it has to have some necessary, okay, uh, uh, necessity of, of, of disease, up to a point, okay, not beyond the point. And, and actually, small diseases. You can use the same argument that small diseases may prevent you from having larger diseases. That's not my question. Yeah, okay. My question was that when you're already sick, your variability is all over the place. No, no, no. Sick is uh, 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 Well, for some people, it is all over the place, depending on what you're measuring. Okay, so this, beca uh, I, I, uh, this may take us outside this. Because okay. The, okay. So the, the point is, I talked about variability in the sense of dispersion of condition uh, uh, overall in your life. Now, when you're sick, of course, you're going to have this personal condition. You may get better and less very well, you see. So, and you get worse, and that will kill you. So, uh, it, it, it's hard to talk about variability, you know, in that context. More, more questions? Oh, here we have a question, actually. Uh, to, uh, what extent, to what extent is randomness necessary in addition to variability? So, you've got okay. the Wednesday, Friday, or intermittent fasting until noon every day. Okay. Uh, the way it looks like the church remedies it, all right, Wednesday, Friday, the Zen becomes too regular, so you impose on it uh, the 40-day fasts. And plus, once in a while, there's going to be war, so that will give you more variability. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, but you're right, uh, uh, the, 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 the way I handle it locally, variability and randomness and disorder and stressor, and all that act the same way. But when you go on a micro, then you start seeing differences. You need something that's called fractal uh, frequency. In other words, let's say I lift weight uh, every Wednesday, right? Not every day, every Wednesday. It's good, but but you need a second layer of randomness, where you have some weeks where some weeks would have four Wednesdays and, and some months would have no Wednesday. You see the idea? So you you, you can go go layering, but it's a little complicated to discuss now. But I call it fractal layering. So you need the fractal layering, in fact, but it's good enough to start. The first, you know, the gain will come from injecting some lack of regularity into the food group, particularly with protein. The second one right, would come, the, the second one would, 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 would you know, uh, is not as necessary uh, as, as the first one. All right, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, very trouble, everyone. <laughs> I, I guess a little bit of an observation that just clicked back there, working with people who want to be elite athletes, they, their variability actually seems to shrink down to almost zero. Like they seem to become actually very fragile. They are the, the, yeah. the, 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 something. Uh, the, 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 the athlete is uh, something completely abnormal for uh, the abnormal for us paleo people or us, let's say, for the paleo people. Because you have to have look at the show you the picture of the breadth of activity to get in nature versus how narrow you need to be to compete. Incidentally, so, so I'll show you the picture of the difference between these two. Look at the difference between the freedom between this walking on stones like this and how narrow this is. And think of doing this competitively. 
how you have to give up on everything. And so like being an A student. You know, never hire an A student because the, the good at taking the exams or the work somewhere else, right? <laughs> <laughs> the same thing with an athlete. An athlete plus look at him, uh, look at this person 20 years from now. They're gonna be a right. There's something chronic stress injury, right? The chronic uh, you know injury uh, is something that is not truly exist in nature because every step you take here is gonna be different from no two steps will ever be the same. For him to be competitive, it has, everything has to be identical. You see, the yeah, it's a completely different, uh, different game. And then compare this to what's called being a flanner in life. You just like you have a library and you have a lot of books in it, and you have the freedom to do what you'd like, and no two, no two days should look exactly the same. Versus someone here who has a, who's worked in an office and uh, has a boss and has monthly performance and has you know, appointments. Look at the difference. You can see it's all in here. All right, thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause. Right, thanks. 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 So we'll take a few minutes stretch break, just like three or four minutes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.